Hello, everyone. My name is Betty Paris, and Carolyn Murray Slutsky is my uh, business partner and my friend. We've been in um, in cahoots for many, many, many years. I won't say how many. I am the physical therapist of the group, and Carolyn is the occupational therapist. And tonight, we're pleased to um, be able to present information on long COVID, on how we recognize it, on understanding it, and improving the quality and of life for the individuals that are suffering from long COVID. Carrie, did you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. No, we'll uh, keep going here. Right. Okay. Then we're going to ask um, Allison to put up the questions. We have questions for the participants. Um, and in, we're interested in how many of you are actually working with or have had experience in, in working with cases um, of long COVID. So either a yes or a no answer. All right, so it looks like 88% of our audience is saying no, while 12% is saying yes. Interesting, interesting, okay. Um, that number, you may have suspicions after our presentation tonight that some of you may actually be treating people with long COVID and it just hasn't been identified. Have any of the people you know, friends, family members, neighbors, had long COVID? Have you experienced it through someone close to you? All right, so right down the middle here, we have 51% saying yes and 49% saying no. Wow. Okay. And then in those of you um, who, in regards to the previous questions, either have a family member, a neighbor, or a friend that have had long COVID, or you've treated long COVID, can you select the age group that was more predominant and those you're familiar with? All right. So we have 4% under 20. 48% seeing the 20, the 20 to 50 year olds and 48% with the over 50s. Okay, good. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That helps us. So we're going to go ahead and start on long COVID and discussing what it is. Um, are you familiar with those of you um, who are practitioners? Are you familiar with any clinics? in your area that are specializing in long COVID in diagnosis and treatment? All right, so I have 97% saying no and 3% saying yes. Ooh, okay. Okay, that's very interesting. Good. So why don't we, uh, are we ready to jump in? Yep. We appreciate everybody spending their evening with us, uh, an hour and a half. Um, and we're excited to give you some general information and really work with you on long COVID. Um, I want to start with a definition of long COVID and then explain to you the importance of this. Um, long COVID, the working definition, is when we have signs and symptoms and conditions that continue or develop after you've been infected initially with COVID-19 or the SARS uh, COVID infection. These symptoms or conditions begin or persist anywhere from four weeks to three months after your initial infection. And these symptoms may fluctuate or relapse over time. Now, what this means is, number one, an individual has to have COVID. So um, they know they had COVID. Um, they could be asymptomatic. They could be mild. They could be se severe. They could be hospitalized with this. So at least they have some identification of COVID. The symptoms of COVID, now think about it. If you're asymptomatic, the symptoms can all of a sudden occur four weeks to three months later. Or you could have symptoms that continue and go, don't go away. 
So you could still test negative after maybe two to three weeks, but you're still symptomatic. Or you may show symptoms, they could go away, they could come back, and all of a sudden you're showing symptoms. So we end up, because of this diagnosis and all the characteristics of it, having a really hard time linking it to that initial COVID infection. Estimates are difficult for this, these types of cases. Conservative estimates are that at least 65 million individuals around the world have had long COVID. Now, as of late 2024, they published information um, that 100 million US citizens have had long COVID. So the numbers have drastically increased in what's being published recently. We know that up to between 10 and 30% of individuals with long COVID were, um, were never hospitalized. And that of those hospitalized, 50 to 70% of those people experienced symptoms of long COVID long after the virus seemed to have been finished or gone. Also, 15% of adults have had long COVID. Again, though, in October, they looked at numbers through the CDC. Between October 18th and the 30th of 2023, and found that 9.5% of American adults previously infected say they were currently experiencing long COVID symptoms, and that millions of American adults are grappling with the after effects of COVID-19 as we speak right now. It's important to realize long COVID is associated with every single age group, acute phase and acute phase disease severity, meaning um, minimal, asymptomatic, moderate, um, and severe and hospitalized cases. The highest percentage of diagnoses, and it's kind of interesting because when we asked our question to you, um, you pretty much fell into this. At least half of you, um, when asked what the age group was, put it into that 36 to 50 year age group. Um, throughout the United States, the highest percentage of diagnosed people are in that 36 to 50 year age group. and um, the most long COVID cases were non-hospitalized individuals. And up to 90% of those living with long COVID um, symptoms, 90% of those reported that they had only mild illness with the infection. Some of them reported not feeling badly at all and then all of a sudden just um, experienced those symptoms from a month to three months afterwards or even longer, and are still many are still suffering with those symptoms. We know that females are much more likely to have long COVID. Um, just under 60% of females have long COVID. And on the screen here, this is a typo for males. Males were at 40.2% of the males had experienced symptoms of long COVID. So females are a little bit higher in the in the uh, prevalences. So also um, of the people that were identified with long COVID, 31% had no identified pre-existing conditions. So they were healthy individuals until they got COVID. And among the people that got long COVID, almost 80% reported limitations in their day-to-day -day activities with 30% of those characterizing the limitations as significant. Among the earlier statistics, the percentage of people who have had long COVID symptoms was um, reported um, to be 19%. And that declined as of June, 2022. So that um, we seem to have experienced a peak in the numbers being reported up until June of 2022. 
Now the numbers have declined and are averaging between 10 and 11% of those people experiencing long COVID who have had um, diagnosed COVID-19 um, infections. Despite that decline, we know the numbers are still very, very high. So just to make sure we all talk the same language, um, it's important to know all the different terms that refer to long COVID. Um, originally, um, everybody, the lay person um, description is long COVID, long hold COVID, or chronic COVID. And this was initially coined um, by parent advocacy groups. And it describes this long lasting symptoms after acute COVID infection. We also have what's called PCC or post COVID conditions. And this is used by the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control as an alternative to the medical diagnosis of PASC. The medical diagnosis post acute sequelae of COVID is known as PASC. And it was introduced by the National Institute of Health to encompass all of the impact over time of the COVID-19 virus. Both PCC and PASC are the two scientific technical terms referring to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children is a term commonly used for long COVID and it's abbreviated MIS-C. Now, not to be confused, there is also a multi-system inflammatory system in adults, MIS-A, which is a separate diagnosis and, and, and a different entity. When it's used with MIS-C, it's the term used for infants and pediatrics. So what are the symptoms? Um, what does long COVID look like? Um, people with long COVID have a range of new ongoing symptoms that can last weeks, months, years after they're infected with COVID-19. And these symptoms can worsen with physical or mental activity. So let's look at some of these symptoms. Tiredness and fatigue are among the most common complaints. And interestingly enough, the reports recently have reported that the Delta and Omicron uh, waves tended to produce um, more complaints of exhaustion and lasting fatigue. Other reports commonly heard are difficulty thinking or concentrating, termed brain fog by many, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, faster beating or a pounding heart rate and heart reported heart palpitations, dizziness, headache, chest pains, cough, joint or muscle pains, depression and anxiety, fever, and loss of taste or smell. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is only a partial list. Some are the more common symptoms, but as we um, cover a little later, um, there are many more types of symptoms of long COVID. The symptoms are hard to explain and they're hard to manage. People with long COVID um, conditions develop and continue to have symptoms that are um, difficult to explain. Now, they may be new symptoms. They may be intermittent and repetitive, going away and coming back, or they may be ongoing symptoms. Many times they'll wax and wane, sometimes being a little worse, sometimes being a little better, but not always. They can be chronic. Um, there are lack of biomarkers or definitive diagnosis for long COVID. We have diagnostic tests that can diagnose whether a person is having a COVID infection. If that person tested, that can be diagnosed. There is no such test for long COVID. Um, there's no current medical tests that capture the functional limitations. They're only now being developed. The questionnaires that um, may lead to a diagnosis of long COVID are only now being tested and developed. So traditional diagnostic tests can't be relied on for this diagnosis. 
So objective laboratory and imaging findings should not be used as the only measure or assessment of patients' well-being. And this lack of um, laboratory testing and imaging um, cannot, uh, cannot be used to validate the existence or the severity and the importance of the patient's symptoms. It becomes really important that physicians and others listen to the clients. Because these objective laboratory testing is not um, really valid in ex um, identifying the severity or the importance of the symptoms. Um, and it's, people are the ones that will tell you they're often misunderstood by healthcare providers um, because the tests won't show anything. Um, and you just need to do a very good history, um, really listen to the clients um, in order to understand it. If we look at how hard this is um, to explain and manage, um, it's hard to recognize the symptoms of long COVID because they're often so far away from the actual initial infection. The signs of long COVID vary per person and are very individualized. Um, and the person who has long COVID often looks great. They look fine, feel terrible, cannot function. So there's a, a, a inconsistency between how they look and how they function. And then lab tests, stress tests, medical tests um, are not reliable. So we've got this difficulty where the person knows something's wrong, um, can't quite link it to COVID, or when they finally link it to COVID and realize they have long COVID, it's how do we get the medical profession and others to really take us seriously? The There's problem with oh, statistics okay. and diagnosing. Um, don't have valid numbers because the test for positive COVID, in, uh, the test for a COVID infection, number one, didn't, didn't exist for a long while when the, the infection first started. Then home testing was developed and a positive diagnosis could be um, received if the person tests with the home test and reports it. They may have a chance of tying long COVID symptoms to the fact that they did indeed have COVID. But many people don't test. They aren't sick enough. The, in, uh, pediatrics for a long time didn't have tests. You couldn't report anything. We knew they were during the pandemic in households filled with people who were exposed or were sick with COVID. But they, the pediatric um, test kits didn't exist, so the diagnosis of COVID couldn't be found. We don't know if it's long COVID, the symptoms that are causing their problems or not. We know that the cases were reported initially in the pandemic to um, 13, 12 or 13 states um, diagnostic uh, and reporting federal agencies. That no longer is the case. Many people don't do their home testing. Many do the home testing. They don't report it. If you don't go to the hospital, the numbers aren't counted. And even the hospitals don't always report those numbers. State to state varies tremendously. We have no idea of the numbers. And we have no idea of who actually um, had COVID, at least initially. And are these symptoms that they're having that are strange and don't seem to make any sense, and there's no diagnostic test to confirm, could they be long COVID in somebody who was never identified as having COVID in the first place? We know that rural and underserved communities are particularly vulnerable because they aren't reached oftentimes to have testing done. They don't seek out the doctor. They don't go to the hospitals. Many aren't educated in the need to do any of this. They catch a cold, what they think is a cold, and they suffer through it. Um, and then months later, a month later, they may have additional signs or symptoms. So we know those populations are very vulnerable to this. 
Okay. Um, as Betty said, a lot of people did not take testing, okay? And if you don't do testing, it's really hard to do research on long COVID. What is the underlying cause of long COVID? So it's been very, very hard um, to get really clean research on anything about long COVID. Um, nowadays, if you think about it, we all buy COVID tests. So there is no way to track who has COVID and who doesn't. If we look at kids, in the very beginning when COVID came out, everybody said the least vulnerable are children. Well, we find out now many of the kids did get COVID, um, but because of the feeling that kids really didn't get COVID or were immune to COVID, a lot of the kids never got tested. Um, and we're finding that, again, all age groups have long COVID. And our kids were not tested um, early on with COVID. And as Betty said, the numbers reported to public agencies um, really are uh, not as accurate because of severe underreporting. So let's look a little bit at long COVID and some of the complications. We know COVID um, is the result or long COVID is the result of COVID. We know it's a virus and that that virus persists in the body and can activate the immune system and cause a multi-system inflammatory response. It potentially involves all organs and can result in long-term or permanent changes in organs um, and systems. So when we look at long COVID or, or co well, long COVID, what we're looking at is an inflammation within the system, a problem with the autoimmune system, an immune dysregulation, okay? And when we talk to and look at research articles, the number one concern is this virus stays in our system and it's viral persistence. So even though we don't feel bad, that virus is often hidden in our system and comes back um, un at unpredictable times. Now we talked about how far reaching the complications of COVID-19 can be. Um, and this is a picture in the adult realm of what things have been noted. Neuropsychiatric changes, that brain fog we talked about, increased episodes and rates of anxiety and depression, and even post-traumatic stress disorder rates have risen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cardiovascular changes have included myocarditis, um, episodes of heart failure, and arrhythmias within the heart system. Musculoskeletal changes include myalgias, muscle pains, joint pains, arthralgias, and generalized physical debility. Dermatological problems have occurred, uh, occurred including rashes, alopecia, which is hair loss, urticaria, which is hives, pulmonary changes that include long-term dyspnea or shortness of breath, oxygen dependence, decreased pulmonary function tests, uh, gastroenterology um, is changed with reports of diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and reports of abdominal pain. Endocrine systems can be affected, kidneys in particular, um, diabetes, um, I'm sorry, diabetes mellitus is on the increase when COVID-19, long COVID sufferers, renal disease um, as a result of renal damage by the virus, and hematological changes that include thromboembolisms or blood clots have occurred. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just an indication of what systems have proven to be affected by long COVID or the COVID virus. 
Okay. So we're going to look a little bit at the long COVID categories and symptoms. Um, Balcom in 2021 looked at long COVID and he categorized it into four categories. The primary um, is cognitive mood or sleep disorders. We have exercise intolerance and we have pain syndromes and auto, um, autonomic nervous system problems. So let's look a little bit further into each of these. Our cognitive category, um, mood and sleep disorders, is when we start to see brain fog. Um, that real foggy, I'm just not thinking clear, nothing's working. The executive dysfunction, I'm just not making good decisions. Um, anxiety, depression, agitation, and psychosis you know, are all signs, um, things that happen with long COVID. Dysautonomia is a, is a big segment of um, long COVID as well. And that's where the nerves within the autonomic nervous system are damaged by the virus and they cause um, heart arrhythmias, they affect blood pressure, they can affect bladder function, digestion, and or sexual dysfunction. You can have heart palpitations. You can have postural or orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which we will talk about a little further in a moment. And you can have episodes of low blood pressure, fainting and, um, and dizzy spells, all due to damage of the nerves by this virus. We also have pain syndromes, which is the myalgic, um, myalgia, the neuro, neuropathic, neuropathic pain, paresthesias, um, numbness, tingling, headaches, ringing in your ears. All of these are directly associated with long COVID. The exercise intolerance includes reports of muscle weakness, exertional shortness of breath or dyspnea, episodes of chronic fatigue syndrome and generalized fatigue. But it's more than just exercise intolerance. We have people struggling to get through the day with normal activities and have excessive fatigue as a result. There's also something that um, a condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis or ME, which is extreme fatigue. And that lasts greater than, or at least six months or greater. And it, the symptoms do not improve with rest. And many people have reported that that's the type of fatigue that they are experiencing. Six months after they had COVID infection, all of a sudden they have trouble with basic skills, dressing. Um, they can no longer shop or they can no longer cook a meal. They're, they have the myalgic encephalomyelitis where the fatigue just lasts hours and days at a time and no rest will help them recover. The multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome in children is the term used for um, post-COVID sequelae, okay? It's a rare and serious condition. Now, multi-system inflammatory syndrome can occur separately as its own entity, either in children or adults. It's rare. But in those children known to have been exposed to COVID or known to have had COVID when the family was sick, they've developed these symptoms a month or later after the initial acute infection has seen in the past. And their long COVID is called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. We don't know what causes it, but the rates are much higher in those exposed to the COVID virus than those that weren't. In children, the symptoms, again, are a little bit different, but they are demonstrative of inflammation and changes in multiple systems. The mucolocutaneous system can include symptoms of rash, swelling of the lips or the tongue, cracking of the lips or the tongue, an extreme 
redness or strawberry tongue, extremity swelling or peeling of the skin, blisters, erosions, and con conjunctivitis can occur. Other indicators of systemic infl inflammation include fever, general myalgias, kids reporting joint pains and aches, fatigue, rapid heart rate, decreased um, blood pressure or hypotension, swelling of the lymph nodes, and hypo or hyper perfusion of the tissues, either a lack of blood supply or too much with reddening of the, um, of the limbs or the skin. The neurological or the cognitive symptoms that are common include headache, altered mental status, Focal deficits such as um, a paralysis in a part of the body. It can be an arm and a leg. It can be a lazy eye that develops. It can be difficulty with swell, uh, feeding and swallowing. And seizures have developed. There can be speech problems, loss or blurring of vision, decrease in hearing, decrease in tongue movements that are noted. From a cardiopulmonary status, there's respiratory distress and reports of chest pain that the child experiences. Gastrointestinal symptoms are co quite common, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and reports of ongoing abdominal pains that can't be explained. Those are symptoms of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. So we need to also talk a little bit about some of the autoimmune problems um, that we see as part of long COVID. Um, they also impact um, exercise. In Belcom's graph, one of those was um, autoimmune and one was exercise. Um, almost all of these categories really impact both. Um, they originate from autoimmune problems, but lead up to um, you know, impact exercise and function tremendously. Now we have chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, which Betty talked about, which is ME, and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is also known as POTS. We know 60% of those with mild COVID developed POTS, and 47% had persistent fatigue or exertional fatigue, which could be the ME or the CFS. So we've got a high percentage of those with long COVID um, exhibiting problems like this. Um, these are considered auto, autonomic instability um, caused by COVID-19 that manifests as tachycardia, postural hypotension, which is low, hypertension, which is high, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which Betty will go through in great detail, and low-grade fevers um, also associated with bowel, bladder, or sexual dysfunction. All of these are linked as autonomic instability. Now, the spectrum described um, in long COVID, um, because many of the clients with long COVID are showing symptoms of things we know, chronic fatigue syndrome we know, um, ME we know, POTS we know, and because the long COVID individuals are showing signs of this, the question comes up, is it, chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it myalgic encephalomyelitis? Is it POTS? Or is it long COVID showing us with signs of this? Is the etiology, the underlying problem the same or is it different? So they share common uh, symptoms of fatigue, autonomic instability, um, post-exertional myalgia, weaknesses, as well as neurocognitive uh, impairments. But are they actually the same? And that's something they're really looking at and trying to struggle with. At this point, our only treatment is to treat 
what we know, but yet we know the etiology is COVID. So chronic fatigue syndrome is characterized by profound tiredness, regardless of bed rest. Um, the symptoms actually worsen with physical activity and mental activity. Um, shortly, we're gonna be showing a, a case study and many, this young man has many of these issues. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms that people most complain of are sensitivity to light, headache, tenderness in the lymph nodes, extreme fatigue or weakness, muscle and joint pain, an inability to concentrate, a lack of sleep or difficulty with sleep patterns, episodes of forgetfulness, mood swings, confusion, and low-grade fevers and depression. Now there's also, just to confuse things, another type of syndrome um, that's called post-exertional malaise syndrome or PEM. And that's a worsening of symptoms with physical or mental exertion. The fatigue usually occurs 12 to 72 hours after the activity. So the person gets through the activity and then the exertion and the fatigue and the malaise occur hours later. And it lasts from days to weeks at a time. So the recovery is very prolonged and the more physical or mental activity the person performs, the longer the fatigue and the exhaustion um, occur. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome and um, myalgic encephalitis <laughs> um, are, are often used interchangeably. Um, and it really directly impacts a, a person's ability um, to perform daily activities. Bathing, showering, preparing a meal are all often impacted. Um, many people cannot keep a job. Again, you're going to listen to um, Luke talk about how difficult it's been for him to go to school. Um, many people um, can't go to the office. Um, just the process of getting ready and going to an office and working um, just uh, is exhausting to them. This can last for years and sometimes leads to serious disabilities. Um, at least one in four people with ME or CFS um, are bedridden or housebound um, for long periods during their illness. Um, and another really concerning issue here is the people that have this look fine. They really look okay. Um, and they look the same way they did before they got the illness. So it really um, is mind boggling and, um, has quite an impact because other people don't understand. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, known as POTS, is a condition that roughly 60% of the people who had COVID suffer from this and if they have long COVID symptoms. What happens is the a rapid increase in heart rate without changes in blood pressure when the person changes position, either goes from lying to sitting or to stand. In order to qualify for the diagnosis of POTS, the heartbeat increases 30 beats per minute for adults, and in P and adolescents, it's 40 beats per minute just upon changing position and there's no demonstrable change in blood pressure. It's simply heart rate that changes. And it happens because the blood stays in the lower half of the body. So what happens, the brain, the heart, the lungs don't get the oxygen they need. So the complaints are dizziness, intolerance of being upright, whether it's seated or standing, rapid heart rate, lightheadedness, fainting, fatigue, 
Again, you can have changes in blood pressure. There's an inability to exercise. There's nausea, anxiety, the fear of passing out or fear of falling. Sometimes blurred vision occurs and often headaches are associated with the condition. Hmm. Okay, we can't talk about long COVID unless we talk about the mental health impact of long COVID. Um, and actually the mental health impact of COVID. Um, we often look, um, so many things have happened since um, we went through the pandemic. Um, one of the things we really look at is the trauma that COVID impacted upon almost everybody. When we look at COVID, um, everybody went through it. Children, adults, geriatrics, everybody experienced the uh, pandemic. Everybody experienced the lockdown. Um, and all of that qualifies as a traumatic event. Um, the definition, uh, layman's definition of traumatic event is a stressful event that is unpredictable, extreme, prolonged, and based on unknown or unfamiliar dangers, COVID. Um, this danger um, uh, and danger response can trigger an autonomic physiological reaction of the um, immune system and of stress. Um, children with traumatic histories, okay, um, automatically became anxious based on their traumatic histories. And the COVID triggered an automatic reaction, a physiological reaction of stress due to previous traumas. We also know that with COVID, um, many children were um, subjected to maltreatment, to abuse, um, to exposure to family violence. We know that when um, there was limited access for families that were vulnerable to support services. Uh, families were just left out there alone to fend for themselves. Many of them had really poor coping strategies. Um, there was increased caregiver distress, um, dysfunctional coping, substance abuse within the family. All of this added to the trauma um, that children experienced, that adults experienced, um, that the schools fell, fell apart, we had no support systems, um, therapy may have continued, but many um, of it was disbanded. And then we add to that the personal traumas that some people experience, meaning loss of loved ones. Many people lost their jobs, financial insecurity, um, financial problems, social isolation. All of this led to trauma for everybody throughout the United States, throughout the world, and really and impacted the mental health. Parents were also under stress too, because all of a sudden they were trying to work from home, assist oftentimes multiple children, trying to attend school, doing homework, supporting them during learning activities, all while trying to report to work and keep the finances going. Many of the companies furloughed people because they had no need for um, their employees while they were shut down. So the stress on adults was greater as well. So everyone suffered. In addition to being sick, many of those caught COVID themselves. Whole families were ill with the disease and not feeling well. So the pandemic really wrought an awful lot of trauma on people of all ages in all environments. So COVID and long COVID impacted people of all ages, um, people's ability to function, function mentally, cognitively, and physically. It impacted everybody's ability or many people's ability to perform um, their activities of daily living, their ability to work, go to school, socialize, um, people with disabilities 
um, were known to have regressions and um, were left worse than they were prior to COVID. Um, and with um, many mental health issues of anxiety, depression, um, and so much more. So when we start to look at mental health concerns that came out of the pandemic, um, we realize that um, all of those factors, you can't separate out um, all of the trauma and, and things that happened because of the pandemic from um, the neurological problems, the mental health problems. Is it COVID? Is it the lockdown? Is it long COVID? Where is this coming from? Is it a neuro new neurological problem? Um, is it, where is this coming from? It's almost impossible to isolate and look at clean research, especially when there's even a worsening of pre-pandemic psychiatric diagnoses and symptoms. So we do see a lot of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, grief, substance abuse, and sleeping disorders, all do um, confounding the uh, mental health issues. Now, with long COVID, um, there's some evidence. Um, I know one of the tests that they're doing to identify if a lot of the symptoms are long COVID is a blood test that looks at cytokines circulating in the um, blood system. There's evidence that the body's inflammation response, specifically cy circulating cytokines, may contribute to the worsening of mental health symptoms or may bring on new symptoms of anxiety, depression. Um, cytokines um, also affect levels of brain chemicals such as serotonin and others and can contribute to brain fog um, and is a, almost a warning sign or um, a red flag um, that if the cytokines are elevated, um, what you might be experiencing is actually long COVID. Other things to consider researchers are looking into besides the cytokines as possible triggers for mental health disorders that we're seeing are um, the persistence of the virus within the body. They're finding that in some individuals, remnants of the virus last for months to uh, after over a year and is, seems to be active in the body on, on a sub-acute level. Also, we know that miniature blood clots may form in certain organs and cause body and brain changes. Changes to the gut with the abdominal pain and the abdominal symptoms um, may affect the way we digest and absorb certain things. And um, might that contribute to some, the rises in mental health disorders and problems that we see? Or um, is it simply other issues, the effect of the, simply, the effect of the trauma of the pandemic that we just explained to everyone and the fact that people suffered for so long at home through the pandemic. So they're looking for multiple avenues um, to explain the changes that occur with long COVID. We know that um, Fatigue, brain fog, sleep disorders, tachycardia can all exist in and of themselves. And they can mimic long sim COVID symptoms, but they also may be part of that d syndrome as well and due to the COVID virus. So much more work needs to be done in trying to tease this out. We know that in particular, children were vulnerable. and. Um, there was it has been research done on um, the the autism group, those affected with autism spectrum disorder, and we know that um, the rates for risk were elevated in this particular group. The um, the rates of increasing symptomology in 
individuals with autism um, is roughly 59% that they uh, the sufferers of autism experienced either a worsening of the pre-pandemic psychiatric diagnosis or developed a new um, psychiatric symptoms after the pandemic. So we know that the, this particular group was affected by the pandemic and by the virus itself. So we wanna look a little bit into long COVID treatments. What can we do? How can we help clients? Um, outcome, participation, improve the quality of life, assist clients, families, and everyone dealing with long COVID. Um, we know that long COVID requires a holistic approach. It impacts every aspect of a person's life. Um, as an occupational therapist, okay, we're trained in physical disabilities, occupation-based practices, school system, developmental disabilities, mental health and trauma-informed care, all of areas that require that individuals who experience long COVID need help in. Um, realizing long COVID impacts people of all ages, their ability to function, it impacts them physically often. Needs They need exercise, they need to be able to engage in activities, um, school, social, recreational work. Um, we know that um, individuals with developmental disabilities or dif difficulties um, often need more help than usual because they got they often are worse than they were before. Um, and we know that um, we've talked a little bit about the mental health implications. So um, for occupational therapists out there, we didn't do a survey to find out how many are there. Uh, the World Federation of Occupational Therapists did a survey in 2023 looking at what is OT's role. Um, and throughout the world, the role is to increase participation in activities of daily living, management of the fatigue syndrome symptoms, cognitive functioning, self-management skills, mental health. Um, adapting the environment to help increase function and um, relaxation, breathing, positioning to help with the respiratory system and social support and engagement. Um, I also believe that OT's role is also to help increase um, individuals' endurance and ability um, for um, managing and improving their underlying um, physical abilities. So Betty, go ahead, we'll start with that. We're gonna present um, a case study for you. Uh, and Luke was part of a two day presentation by the um, Social Security Administration um, and the website I believe is listed in your handouts. Um, we're gonna play portions of Luke's um, um, story. Um, the Social Security Administration at this point, and this was done in March of 2022, so like mid pandemic at this point, um, everything seemed to close down in um, 2020, March, um, April, May, June, those uh, many of the, Places were closing down. People were getting inundated with the COVID virus. By March of 2022, the Social Security Administration was being inundated and struggling with what are the effects of long COVID, of COVID? Um, how long is the disability expected to occur? Because people were applying for long-term disability as a financial support to their problems. And they had many um, representatives from the different clinics and reporting centers throughout the United States. And as part of this presentation, they had several patients um, present their symptoms. And we couldn't go through all of them. We chose Luke. He's very well spoken. 
Um, it, his mom helped him with these. We're going to play portions of this to you so you can understand their story. And we'd like you to just reflect a little bit on on um, on the physical, the mental, the cognitive um, effects of long COVID, because we're going to discuss a little bit more after we hear what Luke and his mother have to say. We're going to um, be talking more about Luke as we um, go through um, our pre the, more of the uh, presentation and treatments. And we're going to ask for your input on that as we get towards the end here. Um, if you want to see more of the videos, by all means, um, you've got your the website and your handouts. Um, there's lots more videos um, and a lot of educational material. Um, and we're going to look at how um, long COVID impacts Luke's physical, emotional, psychological, cognitive, social, and functional, and quality of life as we go through this. So what are key considerations when treating individuals with long COVID or suspected long COVID? Um, the number one factor that we believe strongly is that you have to listen to the client. You have to listen to the caretaker. Their symptoms and concerns are priorities. Um, often they have a long history of not being listened to or believed by other people. They tend to be labeled as malingerers um, because the tests don't prove that there's anything wrong with them. Um, one of Luke's complaints in, in his uh, interview was that he was getting um, attitude from his three brothers that he didn't want to do his chores. He was faking and malingering um, because he didn't want to do anything. And um, I think that happens a lot in the medical field, unfortunately. If we can't document that there's an actual problem, we tend um, to hear people saying, well, there is no problem. I don't know what you're talking about. And I think we have to step back and say, in this instance, maybe there is something here that we should really pay attention to. Um, it's really important that we look at these clients from a holistic point of view. Um, and help them assess their needs and determine the underlying causes and intervention. Um, and as Luke and his mom pointed out, it's really important we get them into the hands of medical professions, professionals that really know long COVID. Because again, long COVID may not be exactly like the medical diagnoses we know like CFS or ME or, um, you know, POTS. Um, we need that medical input. We need people that understand and know and are doing research on long COVID. So they need a medical treatment. Uh, we need to help and advocate for them um, and help expand um, their support networks because this is not a, a single um, individual problem. It's multi-system. There are modifications and accommodations we can make um, if it's an individual in school, someone at home, or in the work environments of the clients we treat. We need to look at how do we save them from that exhaustion? What accommodations can we make? What modifications to tasks can we make in order to make their quality of life and their ability to participate and function better? We need to um, also get them up and moving, which is difficult considering the different types of problems we see post-exercise. We need to manage the complications of the long COVID while we look at issues of flexibility, stretching where we need to stretch, range of motion, balance exercises, gentle strengthening, training for endurance, fall prevention, modifications in activity levels. And yet we also as a 
ther as therapists need to monitor that client for what happens if they don't have symptoms immediately after. Do they have symptoms two or three days after? Because it could be part of this syndrome. And we need to be aware of the effects. Don't just say, oh, no, it couldn't possibly be what we did on Monday that you're feeling bad by Wednesday, because that's no longer true. We need to look at energy conservation and pacing of important tasks so that they can get the shower in. They can do shampoo their hair. They can make a meal or pack a lunch, whatever they need to do. They need to establish routines and habits that can help limit or avoid some of their symptoms while getting them to function. We need to educate them on strategies to manage post-fatigue syndrome and their exertional fatigue or how to manage their dyspnea and provide structured, symptom-guided, individual return programs to return to the activities that are important to that person and that they are tailored to the severity of their particular symptoms. As you saw with Luke, socialization, he had no time to socialize. If this continues, he had long COVID for at least a year, um, a year at the time that we saw the video. It's important that we look at um, how can we build in socialization for him? Um, how do we prioritize and facilitate what's meaningful to them? What, what gives them quality of life? Um, how can we help them get back to that? Um, all of this becomes so important. We also ha have to really ask as part of the question, our questions, um, how are they sleeping? Can we help them with that? And pain management. Um, a lot of times pain is what will stop people from functioning as, long, as well as fatigue. And we need to be able to keep that into consideration. Um, mental health um, is something we really need to um, address. And some of the key components of trauma-informed care is trust, belief, safety, support. Be there for the individual. Really help them out. Um, many need psychosocial support, um, believing that um, they're ill and life will return to normal. How can we make that happen? And also um, mindfulness. Um, a lot of times the easy um, um, exercises such as yoga can be um, performed without overstressing the body, tai chi, deep breathing, meditation. All of these can be beneficial to help reduce stress, um, anxiety, um, and help everybody get grounded. And finally, um, again, taking really um, helping the individual um, cope and deal. Um, guided meditation is often very beneficial. Exercises um, to show compassion in order to deal with brain fog. Um, you know, uh, helping them deal with their frustrations, uh, isolation, depression, uh, uh, fear that they may never um, be able to function again, all become very, very important. Now, before we talk about Luke, I just want to make a couple comments. Um, occupational, uh, long COVID is um, directly impacts quality of life. When we talked um, to people and when we looked at the research, the number one issue um, people with long COVID felt was that long COVID impacted the quality of life. The things that were important to them, they could not do. Um, and that becomes, should become our number one goal. How can we help people resume their previous life, but also how do we get quality of life back? Um, and as an occupational therapist, um, and as an occupational therapist out there, we specialize in improving quality of life. Uh, so this should be an area that we really need to focus on 
and excel in. So let's take a look at Luke. You want to? When we look at Luke, we're going to ask what would you recommend or what do you feel you have to offer to Luke for his physical complaints? And we'd like you to put it in the chat, if you will. Um, Allie, will you be able to read some of the answers to us? Yep, just put them in the chat and I will send them your way. Okay, so we know that physically, Luke complains of pain, nausea, dizziness. He feels weak, low endurance. Um, and he had that post-exertional malaise syndrome where he suffered exhaustion that could last for days or weeks after physical or mental engagement. Um, so what would you recommend for Luke? How can we help him um, physically? All right, so we have energy conservation coming in as a suggestion. Excellent. Let's see if we have any more thing. Uh, exercise and balance. If anybody else has any other suggestions, you can pop it right in the questions box where you would ask your questions. We have pacing, strength building. Okay. So we, he needs to stay physically active. If he continues, um, he will decondition. So we need to teach him um, with the pots. He may start out with exercises in bed um, where he can try to maintain um, his heart rate. Um, we want to do energy conservation techniques, um, get him up and moving. We may need to set up routines for, for Luke too, where he concentrates on a certain body part, either upper body or lower body in a given day and then switches the next time instead of doing a total body routine. So we need to monitor um, what we give him, go very, very slow. We may start with just isometrics. Um, if he can't tolerate changes in positions, what else could we do for him? You know, uh, TheraBand exercises may or may not work for him. Simply isometric exercises may be better. So we have to get a little creative and we have to monitor very carefully what we give to Luke. Emotionally and psychologically, we know um, he's trying very hard to man up. Um, but we know this impacts him. He's he's no longer the child he was. It was his senior year. He's lost out on so much. Um, you know, he can't participate in sports. Um, and a lot of people say he's just his brothers say you're just lazy. You, you, this isn't real. Um, what kind of things might we offer him for emotional or psychological support? Okay, while well, those are coming in, we just had a few more suggestions for the last one. So breathing exercise, gradual development of physical exercises, time management, yoga, breathing, yoga. Lots of good suggestions here. Oh, uh, so we see begin with chair exercises, seated yoga videos, uh, moving meditation, break down tasks into tiny parts, task modification. Uh, Okay, and now we're getting into psychological supports here. We have to find a support group for him, support group via virtual means, family education, um, modifications for academics, so audiobooks, voice to text, and recording of lecture schedules with breaks, uh, meditation, support groups, environmental modifications, educate the family, set small goals that he can achieve, connect him with others who have long COVID even through Zoom, um, extend time for tests and assignments and possible team participating by possible team participation by keeping stats. I excellent. think uh, those are all excellent. I think advocating for him and educating those people around him, family members, uh, teachers, supports. One big um, concern both for he and his family, he was a straight A student um, aiming for scholarships, both sports scholarships and academic scholarships, and now he's not even um, convinced he can attend uh, 
graduate high school and attend college. So he's going to need some support and maybe look at um, his whole plan for college. What will he study? What can he do for scheduling? Um, will it be online or will it be uh, somewhere where he has to go physically? What kind of scheduling he has to do? So we have to look at those as well for future planning for him. Okay, cognitively, um, he complains of brain fog. Um, he can't predict when he can actually function for school or take tests. Um, what would you recommend? We can expand to that. Okay, so we have access, digital accommodations at the college, journaling to keep track, using voice memo, modified work, 504 plan, work and accessibility services at school, uh, readjust expectations, a visit to disability services to set a schedule, help set up planners through computer or papers, two sets of books, books on tape, instructions and in being sure not to overdo it on good days. Perfect, perfect. Excellent. Okay, um, including uh, differential instructions um, where, um, you know, or differential assignments and test modifications. Um, a lot of times if, he's a straight A student, why should he have to struggle for the test? Let's do modifications within the academic environment and really um, advocate for him. Excellent. Instead of writing a long report, maybe he can be tested verbally uh, to prove that he has the material um, and he understands it. You know, certain, how well can he, he produce and prove the knowledge that he has without the physical components? So yes. Okay, socially, he says, I do not have the energy to social socialize. My whole life involves getting through the day at school. Um, what can we do to help him feel that um, he's social and get him more engaged with others? Looks like this is a hard question. All right, now we're starting to get some answers. So support <laughs> groups, kids his age, social media, not push them, games online with friends. Okay. How about um, peer to peer okay. assistance? Setting up peer to peer assistance for him for things he you know, can't need help schedule in um, having um, uh, getting the school to buy in where a buddy comes and helps him with his work um and can actually um take some of the uh physical work off of him but they can work together would be a great alternative um to make him feel not isolated all right just a couple other answers that came in so maybe some time even with brothers watching sports support groups church groups that can space out visits um pets yeah it's a tough one peer help support groups peer tutoring there we go. Good. And we've, we've really addressed a lot of this functional. Um, he can't participate in athletic school, can't help around the house. Um, he gets tired eating. Uh, just everything is too much for him. So, um, and we talked a lot about energy conservation, pacing himself. Um, any other suggestions? Uh, please put it in the chat. Okay, so we have work simplification. Uh, teaching how to break down tasks into smaller bits. Uh, meet, he may need to take time off from school. Finding new strengths and interests to build self-esteem. Uh, could do chore seated or use adaptive equipment. Set up a schedule with, sh with short times for tasks. Right. And for him and access to Google Home, sitting up, sitting for standard for showers and other tasks like laundry. 
He mentioned that he's unable to eat a large meal without um, adverse side effects. So maybe a nutritional consult would be in order. Maybe breaking down his meals into five snacks a day instead of meals. Um, maybe identifying the types of food he eats that may contribute to the exhaustion and those that aren't quite so hard to digest for him. So don't forget the nutritional aspect as well. You all did well. That was very good. <laughs> Excellent. And, and that, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Anybody with uh, any questions? All right. So we just have a comment coming in here. Um, POTS requires increased salt take along uh, talking about nutrition. So thanks for that info, Susan. Um, a question not about the topic, but about, about AOTA. Will you be at the Therapro booth? We will be at the Therapro booth. Yes, definitely. we will be. <laughs> um, definitely. You will find us at the Therapro booth as well as um, the two sessions we'll be teaching. 